Well, the first thing I want to say is I deserve absolutely no credit for the title embedded criminologists in police departments, maybe the in police departments part. But I, I took that directly from Joan Peter Cilia, who wrote a, a really nice article reflecting upon her experiences working for Governor Schwarzenegger on prison reform, uh, serving uh, him and, and trying to implement evidence-based corrections and influence policy in California. And she titled the article, you know, Reflections from an Embedded, Crim Crim embedded Criminologist. Uh, so, but I, I, I do really think, you know, what Joan had done uh, was, was very important. It, it was you know, not, a, not just about collaborating with the police uh, or, in this case, with the governor's office on correctional reform, um, but actually getting out there and getting involved in a, in, in, in a way that could, I, I think, make a, a, a bigger difference. Um, all right, good. No clicker for me. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a sense for uh, the presentation I'd be delivering before delivering it. Uh, first, I just want to talk about the evolution of my relationship with the Boston Police Department, uh, the work that I did as an embedded criminologist in the Boston Police Department. I'm going to talk in a bit more detail about some of the action research projects uh, that I did with the Boston Police. Uh, and then I'm going to conclude with benefits for academics and police and some final thoughts on on some of the, the benefits and the stressors in making uh, these types of uh, relationships work. Okay. So I've been working with the Boston Police Department on a series of projects since 1994. Uh, so you know, quite a long time now, nearly 20 years I've been working with that agency. And I started off working on what became known as the, uh, the Boston Gun Project, Operation Ceasefire with David Kennedy. And I stuck with it through a series of different projects over the years, you know, looking at illicit gun markets, thinking about prisoner reentry, trying to understand the uh, improvements in ballistics imaging technology, on the ability of detectives to uh, move investigations forward. And it was very much a, a project-oriented relationship. And each of these different research initiatives were based on you know, uh, areas of, of substantive agreement and concern. So essentially the way I would, I would start a partnership would, on a particular subject would be either you know, somebody in the Boston Police Department would call me and say, hey, we've, we're developing this innovative prisoner reentry program, or we're really interested in trying to understand how this IBIS technology works to help us uh, make links between criminals. And I would say, you know what, I have an interest in that as well. And we would start talking about what a project might look like. So for me, it's a lot of, you know, the, the issues that they're wrestling with in the moment, you know, matching some of my theoretical interests. So for example, I've always, you know, being David Weisberg's student, been very interested in the distribution of crime throughout cities and trying to understand hotspots and what makes one place a hotspot and another place not a hotspot or a cool spot. I'm also very interested in program evaluation. You know, I just like trying to figure out whether something actually had its intended impacts. Uh, and I really have, uh, focused a lot of my career on trying to do randomized controlled trials and quasi-experimental evaluations to really try and unpack and understand whether interventions are having their desired impacts. For the police, it's, it's a much more you know, basic set of concerns that are really important to the day-to-day -day work that they do in the community. You know, what's going on? Hey, we have a, a spike in robbery. You know, does it, is it tied to these uh, smartphones people are walking around with and not paying attention? You know, is it something else? You know, can you help us understand what's going on with this increase in shootings that we're, we're seeing? Is it a resurgence in gang violence? Is it tried to dug markets? Or is it something else? And also, they're interested in what, what should we do? You know, how should we deal with this problem once we've understood it? You know, should we be doing more of the same thing? Should we be doing different things? You know, do we need new strategic partnerships? So they're very concerned in a, in a real operational way about the way they're doing their job in the community and how most of uh, efficiently and effectively they should be delivering the services. Uh, and I've also done most of my work in this, you know, a lot of people in the room, uh, Travis Taniguchi, Jerry Radcliffe, that the relationship is as important uh, as the project itself or as, as the results. Uh, trying to be as, as sensitive as possible to the very complex political environment that police departments exist in. You know, for us it's often, us being the academics in the room, you know, if it's often, you know, why aren't you just doing this, right? When, you know, doing whatever it is that you're suggesting, which might seem so simple to us, actually, you know, in a complicated urban environment is a really big ask. They might have to rob Peter 
to, play, to, to pay Paul. So being very sensitive to the political environment and their operational constraints is always very important. Uh, and also being consistent, uh, attending meetings. I, I've always gone to whatever project I've been involved with, every single project meeting. I've gone to a lot of the CompStat meetings that they've had over time. Uh, when, as my uh, relationship changed, going to all the bureau chiefs meetings, doing ride-alongs. I think it's incredibly important if you are doing a project on gang violence, actually to get out there and get in the cars with the gang unit officers and observe them do their job and ask them questions about what they're doing and why. So they have an opportunity to educate you on the challenges that they're facing out there in the field so you can have a better appreciation for why they're doing the things that they're doing. And then you also can pick their brain on, hey, if you could do anything, if you weren't part of this organization and you could change something about your job to make it easier, what would that be? And you often get a lot of, of very you know, important, powerful insights that people at the line level have that never make its way up the organization because that's not the way a lot of police organizations work. And also being responsive to requests. Uh, you know, I can't say how many times I've ha gotten these little assignments that you do out of the goodness of your heart because you're a partner. Right? If you're working with the police department in an effective way and they say, hey, I need a little help trying to figure out you know, whether, for example, uh, some of the captains in CompStat are complaining that they don't get a good count on their, on their uh, crimes, that uh, the field reports units, shortchanging them, adding extra robberies on there that they don't think are really robberies. So can you tell me what's going on here? The answer was that for that situation, after reviewing data, interviewing people in field reports, interviewing people in one of the districts that was complaining, that it came down to more effective supervision of the paperwork at the district level for the, uh, uh, the sergeant detectives and lieutenants who were responsible for that paperwork on the ships. So basically, if the captain wanted a better count, you know, it was in his ability to get that better count if he just paid better attention to the, uh, uh, the people who were doing the paperwork via the people who should be uh, supervising it. Okay, next slide. Okay, so what changed that became that, you know, I decided, okay, well, this is something different. And what was different was uh, Ed Davis, when Ed Davis became the Boston Police Commissioner in 2006. I had worked with him for many years, starting in about 1997 is when I first met him. We worked together on gang violence reduction strategies, hotspots policing strategies, thinking statewide, because Ed Davis was very interested in statewide policy over the processing of crime, crime guns and making sure that all guns would be traced because he recognized that gun traffickers sometimes don't respect jurisdictional boundaries. So we worked on a series of projects and I developed a, a very strong working relationship with him. Uh, he trusted me, we became friends. And when he was appointed commissioner in 2006, you know, he, even before when he was in the running, we were talking already about you know, these are things that could be changed in the Boston Police Department that really you know, would make it a, a more effective institution. But as soon as he took over, he just engaged me in a day-to-day -day way where he wanted to understand you know, why certain programs were implemented, uh, the, the, the current set of crime control strategies, how they should be organizing themselves to do something different. And I started getting really involved in a lot of his day-to-day -day decision making and basically with him for large chunks of every day of the week, which set off a lot of conversation in the command staff. Now, they all had known me for, since I'd been working with uh, the police department at that point for about 14, 15 years. And they were saying, well, what is Anthony doing? Is he trying to position himself to be a deputy commissioner? <laughs> now, what, what is it he sh that he's trying to do here? And it was sort of unsettling because nothing was ever formally announced. And once this problem, you know, one of the deputy superintendents pull me aside and say, hey, people are grumbling. They want to know what you're doing with the new commissioner. Uh, I said, okay, well, let me talk to Ed Davis about it. And he said, you know, it, it'll be very helpful if we just explain to them who you are to me and what work you're doing and why you're asking all these questions. So in February 2007, he appointed me formally his chief policy advisor. He sent out a memo to the entire department uh, detailing what my qualifications were, that he wanted me to focus in on uh, his violent crime control strategies, and that I'd be working out of his office, and he gave me a, a desk in an office in his commissioner's suite. I shared the office with one of the other deputy superintendents who, who was char in charge of 
what eventually became his Hotspots Policing Program. Uh, and he gave me a Boston Police Department email address. Uh, so I would just send everything to them from their own email address. Uh, and that's when I, I feel like I became officially embedded in, in a very, very different way, uh, a recognized part of the police organization as being somebody who's working out of the office of the police commissioner. And Ed Davis being an incredibly thoughtful guy, and you know, he's, he's somebody who just does a lot of reading. And he is very interested in academic research. And he was convinced that he could, when he was first uh, appointed commissioner, you had three years in a row where shootings were increasing pretty dramatically. It was about a 55% increase in shootings between 2004 and 2006 in the city of Boston, as well as a general increase in violent crime in the city as well. Uh, and he was convinced that it all came down to the ability of the Boston Police Department to manage a small number of people in a small number of places that were generating most of the problems. And he very much wanted me to work on uh, a risky people, risky places strategy. And this is when I said, okay, well, this is gonna take a significant investment of my time. And he said, all right, well, I've got some money in my budget. So he took from some safe co same cop, same neighborhood money that he had squirreled away. And he said, okay, let's get a contract where I'm gonna buy half of your time out from Harvard University to work with me on these projects. Uh, so he put his money where his mouth was. He took money out of his own budget. He valued the work so much that uh, he wanted me just to focus on that as well as other things that uh, he was concerned about. Uh, so I'm gonna talk to you about each of those projects, but it wasn't just these two strategies to control the small number of people and the small number of places that were generating a lot of the violence in Boston. There were a lot of other things that he uh, worked with me on, that he asked me to, to give him some uh, insights on. And, and uh, for example, when they were developing uh, the new CompStat, they had been doing something like CompStat, but he really wanted to do uh, CompStat for real, as he said, in the Boston Police Department. And he said, look, you know, I really want to understand you know, different ways we can better integrate problem solving into a CompStat framework because he was very familiar with the Police Foundation study and some of the work that James did in Lowell, saying they weren't actually doing problem solving in Lowell Police Department's uh, CompStat. So he had me think about how can we set up CompStat in different ways to encourage more problem solving in that setting. Also, they had a gun buyback uh, foisted upon them. And I would say, hey, look, you know this isn't going to reduce crime. There's no evidence that suggests that gun buybacks, in fact, reduce uh, violence. Uh, but he said, yeah, but you know, how can we do this so we maximize the ability of this program to, to reduce some violence? I said, okay, well, it turns out that you can probably, I mean, there's different things that you can do to change this gun buy pro buyback program so you can maximize your ability to get the guns are actually being used in crime off the streets. You know, one is the, the original gun buy pro buyback program, which I evaluated with David Kennedy, you had a tremendous number of older guns that people from the suburbs, in particular licensed dealers, were just emptying you know, their, their excess uh, inventory uh, by going to Boston and just dumping all these old shotguns and, uh, and rifles. And I said, there's no licensed dealers in Boston. You know, even though you can guarantee people anonymity on the gun that they turned in, you should at least make them confirm that they are indeed a Boston resident. Because right? then you'll get rid of all the suburbs, suburb people coming in. Uh, you also want to maybe have a sliding scale for the amount of money you pay for each of these guns. For a handgun, $200. You know, for a shotgun, uh, either no money or $50. They ended up giving out $50 for some shotguns, etc. So, and then trying to get uh, people in particular neighborhoods more likely to go to gun buyback locations by not just having them in police districts, but by having them in churches and other community centers. So, you know, by thinking about, you know, what does the scientific evidence suggest about why these programs don't work, you know, trying to build a program that would maximize the ability to get the right types of guns off the street. And in fact, even though there's no evidence still that it reduced gun violence in the city, it dramatically improved the types of guns that were taken off the street for that one particular gun buyback. And then he also had me do what I called 
well, it's not my phrase, it's actually a John Lobb phrase that George Mason uses quite a lot, uh, their Center for Evidence-Based Crime Policy, translational criminology. Uh, he would often have me talk in uh, some of their bureau chiefs meetings, uh, which I would attend every week. It was all the superintendents in charge of investigations, patrol, internal affairs, the academy, and his civilian executive staff. So he'd have me talk on certain, certain topics. So he, was, uh, he went to an NIJ uh, conference a couple of years ago where he was on a plenary session with Rob Sampson. He was very impressed by these ideas of collective efficacy and legal cynicism. And he thought it would be a good idea for the members of his command staff to become more familiar with what collective efficacy is and why it's uh, you know, an important uh, ingredient and in whether neighborhoods are able to stand on its own and exert certain formal social control, as well as legal cynicism, you know, the, you know, the uh, um, poor relationships or the attitudes and perceptions that people within certain neighborhoods have of police departments. So I would give these types of presentations as well in these command staff meetings to talk about what's the, 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 the key aspect of the idea and what does this mean for policing on the street potentially. Um, so he would have me do a lot of those things. So these are the, you know, the general types of work that I did as an embedded criminologist within the police department. Now I just wanted to say something about randomized experiments because you know, it's something that I try and do as often as possible, uh, but it's not always possible to do one. And I think you know, one thing that Joan Peter Cilia did say in her article is that when it comes to being able to do a, a randomized experiment, timing is everything. And this is certainly true uh, with police departments. Uh, I did a randomized controlled trial of hotspots policing in the city of Lowell uh, with Ed Davis, and he got a lot of value out of that uh, experience. Uh, it you know, resulted in a 20% reduction in the treatment hotspots without displacing crime, and he very much wanted to make that a, that a cornerstone of his risky places strategy. But back when we did implemented that, that uh, uh, that experiment back in 2004, he had been a superintendent with the Lowell Police for 10 years, uh, so he was very, very, um, uh, he, had, he was very well established in the police department. He had very good relations with the community. He had a strong relationship with the city manager and the city council, uh, and crime was at a historical low. So it was a great time to do an experiment. You know, he was very, very comfortable in his job. You know, fast forward to Boston Police Department in 2007, brand new commissioner, zero relationship with the community. The mayor was looking at him like, hey, I'm taking a big risk taking this unknown guy from Lowell to head up a uh, major police department because in Boston is incredibly parochial. If you're not from Boston, how can you possibly understand the, the problems of Boston? Uh, so he was looking at Ed as a big risk. Uh, and violent crime was up. So when I was first talking with him about these different strategies, I said, hey, you know, it would be really cool if we did a randomized controlled trial with these hotspots. And he said, absolutely not, Anthony. I don't have the legitimacy to pull that off right now. Uh, I really would like your help in this, uh, but I can't say to this new mayor that we're gonna have places that we're not going to give full attention to and other places that we are. And I said, fine, you know, I backed off. I said, if that's where you're, you're at, I'm not gonna push it with you, you know, but you know, I'd really like to be able to you know, implement these programs in such a way that it would lend itself at least to a rigorous quasi-experimental or controlled evaluation. And he said, of course, we'll root our decisions in data and make sure that we can do this in a way that it can be evaluated because figuring out what works is very, very important. We did, as a side note, over the course when he was commissioner, design an experiment that we weren't able to implement. Uh, it was a uh, part of the BJA Smart Policing uh, Initiative. We we're looking to do an experiment on homicide clearance rates where we were going to be randomly allocating uh, basically bodies to treatment and control squads to have see if a uh, new way of, of doing homicide investigations increased services, increased uh, well, changes in uh, protocols for handling crime scenes and changes in relationships between the detectives and the crime lab, et cetera, would actually improve clearance rates. Um, we didn't actually end up implementing that because the politics around, in the, at the end, 
uh, randomly allocating a, a homicide victim to a treatment squad relative to a control squad, we felt, given Boston's histories of, of, of racial tensions, that if you know, by chance alone you had, you know, during the same week, you know, an African American girl uh, get randomly allocated to the control group and a white girl get randomly allocated to the treatment group, that, that might set off a, a real big problem within the city. So we decided not to do that. So actually, I did not, during his time at the Boston Police Department, uh, get to do a single randomized controlled trial. Um, but I got to do a lot of other really good and interesting stuff. So the risky places strategy. This is a typical crime <laughs> hotspot map in this, it, that crime analysts and police departments all over the place can produce. Basically, in any given year in the city of Boston, about 5% of the city's geography generates between 50 and 60 percent of all the shootings. Uh, and I want to bring your attention to this location here, Grove Hall, a uh, very important uh, area for the city of Boston. It, uh, the city itself gave a lot of tax breaks and made a lot of investments in attracting businesses to that area. So there's now a grocery store, uh, there's a department store, so people in the neighborhood is, you know, Silly as it might, not silly, but as tragic as it might sound, you know, people in this area had no place to get uh, groceries. Uh, they had to jump on a, a bus and travel uh, over to Codman Square, uh, which is much further away. So it was a, it, it's really, in many ways, a story of urban renewal and success for the city of Boston that they're very, very proud of. But you know, it is in the middle of, of Gang Central. And gang kids, being kids like anybody else, they like to go places where they can be see, they can you know see people, they can be seen, they can meet girls, etc. And you do have, you know, unfortunately, regular shootings. In 2010, there were 14 shootings in the area. Uh, another area I just want to bring your attention to is Bowdoin and Geneva, where this is persistently one of the hottest hot spots in the city of Boston, and they had 24 shootings in 2010. Now. We used maps just like this when we first started, started talking about developing a hotspots policing program in the city of Boston. And it was in the bureau chief's meeting and the head of patrol said, okay, well, you know, I do agree with the hotspots perspective, um, but it feels a lot like I'm playing whack-a-mole. You know, I put my people into an area that's, that's really hot and then it pops up in another area. So, you know, I do recognize that hotspots policing makes some sense, but I think it's not flexible enough to chase around the reality of the way shootings happen in the city. So just a very simple look at this, just to test whether his idea was, was right or not. Um, this is for 2009, and you can see that Grove Hall, last, the year before it had 2024 shootings, had 25 shootings, uh, sorry, at 12, so it was twice as hot as it was the previous year. Uh, no, the following year, Bowdoin to Geneva, flat with 24 shootings. All right, you can see how my maps get worse as I go back in time because technology was worse in 2008 relative to 2010. You have in that year, Grove Hall wasn't much of a hot spot at all. Actually, you only had four shootings in the area where Bowdoin and Geneva was completely out of control with 51 shootings. So we started talking about these patterns. And the other thing that you probably notice is that you have all the shootings, even though they might move around a little bit, it still kind of you know, fit this S-shaped curve, which represents some of the most disadvantaged neighborhoods in the city of Boston, where you have a lot of gang turf uh, as well in those areas. And I said, look, you know, in the city of Seattle, uh, David Weisberg, working with Gil Kurlikowski in the Seattle Police Department, they looked at you know, the stability and concentration of crime over time. We could do that here in Boston with shootings, and we could use that as a, as a way to start thinking about you know, this, this idea of how much does crime move around in the city over time, because if you start slicing it thin with your weekly deployment meetings, it might look like it's moving around a lot, but if you look at it over a long window, it might be the same places over and over again. So the head of patrol said, that sounds like a really good idea. Uh, they gave me two programmers uh, from I mean, the Boston Police Department has a, the Boston Regional Intelligence Center and they have programmers in there who are absolutely excellent at what they do. I said, if you give me the programmers, you know, we, can, we can try and figure this out. And I basically replicated a little bit different 
uh, what David and Suming and others uh, had done in Seattle. So we created a database you know, based on street units, street segments, which are the two block faces in between on a particular street in between two streets that would cross it or multiple streets that would cross it. And then we also looked at intersections as well because for shootings you had a lot of kids hanging out on street corners and being shot on street corners, so we thought it was important to include intersections in this analysis as well. Turns out there's 28,530 of these street units in the city of Boston. We then took almost 7,400 shootings that happened over a 30-year period between 1980 and 2008 we geocoded them, and then we counted them to each of these. And this is a graph of what the yearly counts look like uh, of places that had at least, these street units that had at least one shooting during that time period. So in the late 80s, Boston, like a lot of cities, had an increase in shootings associated with the uh, arrival of crack in the cities peaking in 1990 at 369 street units with at least one shooting. Often they had many more shootings. Then you can see during the 1990s a downturn in the number of places that had at least uh, two shootings. And then when we first started doing the analysis, we're in the thick of it here, this subsequent up, uptick in, in shootings. during. So then you can see it de decreasing over time. But what was, what was amazing is if you summed all of these places, uh, that's 3,294. That's 11 and percent of the city. So all of the shootings in the city of Boston over a 30-year period happened in only 11 and percent of the street intersections, uh, street, street segments and intersections in the city. That means 88 and percent of the city over 30 years didn't experience a single shooting. Then. You know, for the academics in the room, we did some serious social science. Uh, for the others, we just did some statistics, um, where we looked at the trajectories of these specific intersections and street units over time. And what we found was that you could group uh, these places into stable locations. That would be places that were persistently hot over time. So think Bowdoin and Geneva. Every year, it had well over 20 shootings. And then in that one bad year, it had 51. So stable, violent places. And then we also saw these, these volatile places that went up and down. That would be like Grove Hall. One year it only had four shootings, another year it had 24 shootings. But if you sum those places up, uh, that's only 5% of the city. But it counts for 74% of all the shootings over time. So 5% of the city, these really small street segments and intersections, generated 74% of all the shootings over that time period. And the blue and the red represent the 5%. So what's amazing about that is the crack epidemic and its peak in 1990 happened in only 5% of the city. The good times during the 1990s, a big decrease, happened in only 5% of the city. And then this resurgence in violence happened in only 5% of the city. So I brought this back, and I'd been you know, conferring with the head of patrol who would be making the large investment in the hotspots policing program. And I brought this back, and I was talking with them about it. And I said, sir, you know, it is in fact true that you do play whack-a-mole in the city, but you're only playing whack-a-mole in 5% of the city. You're not playing whack-a-mole you know, in 95% of the city. These are the places that are persistently hot. And he said, so you, he said, so you want us to stop acting like fire, firefighters and running from place to place putting up fires, and you want us to make investments in these 5%. I said, that's exactly right. I think that's where you're going to get your most leverage on the citywide crime rates by doing something about these 5%. It's not only that these places experience a lot of shootings. This is a different analysis that a PhD student of mine at, at Harvard uh, was working on. It, Harvard School of Public Health does uh, surveys every other year of Boston neighborhoods. They ask the same questions that Rob Sampson does in his Chicago project. So when you look at the, the measure of collective efficacy, you see a strong inverse relationship between the level of a collective efficacy and the amount of shootings that uh, happen in these areas. So I also brought this back to the uh, 
the, the uh, bureau chiefs, and we discussed it. You know, the point being that not only are these pl these are the places that experience the most violence, but they're also the same locations that need your help the most. These are the communities that can't stand up on their own, that need police intervention to help them exert control over their neighborhoods. And also, I don't have this slide for it, but they also had highest levels of legal cynicism. They have the worst relationships with the police department. So you have this, you know, this need of these neighborhoods that are suffering from high levels of shooting, uh, having, being the most vulnerable, but having the worst relationships with the police department. And that set off a really interesting discussion on how do we change that you know, in these very specific areas. And it wasn't just the shootings. Uh, once you know, I showed them results for the shootings, they got excited uh, about, well, does other, do other types of crime in the city of Boston look like that? So I mean, an academic might say, oh, well, shootings, even though you had 7,400 over a 30-year period, those are still relatively rare events. So did the exact same analysis, but with robberies. And we broke it down, street robberies and commercial robberies. Punchline being that doing the same analysis for street robberies, 8% of the street units account for two-thirds of all the street robberies in the city of Boston. And 1% of the street units generate 50% of all of the commercial robberies in the city of Boston. So incredibly concentrated, incredibly concentrated. So this is very convincing evidence uh, that a hotspots policing program to get ahead of the, the crime problem at the citywide level was, was an important thing to do. And also because we did it in partnership, you know, we formed the ideas together, we thought about the hypotheses, I did it with their programmers, I reported it back with them, I, you know, we talked about uh, what do you make of this. Uh, it had a lot of validity. You know, it really felt like it was not just some external academic research project, it had the feel of an internal inquiry you know, that they were really invested in. So Commissioner Davis implemented the Safe Street Teams program at the beginning of 2007. We had done different iterations of, of uh, the analysis to that point of time. I, I presented to the, the completed project. But basically, they identified using similar techniques, 13 areas, uh, which they, they made their picks, you know, subjectively and objectively. Obviously high levels of violence, but they wanted to be sensitive to what the mayor, what places the mayor would really want to see teams and places where community groups really needed to be engaged uh, with uh, whatever new program was being launched. Each team was comprised of one sergeant and six officers and their assignment was very straightforward. Problem-oriented policing to try and uncover the reasons why these places were persistently hot, what are the situations, the dynamics, the characteristics of the location that caused crime to cluster there. They wanted to make sure that they were visible, they weren't allowed to have cars, either they were doing foot patrol or they were on bicycles, and they always had to be wearing their uniforms. They, gave, they were given the explicit assignment to form relationships with merchants and residents in the area, and also to do enforcement work. They weren't gonna be an empty holster squad, they said, look, there are bad guys that frequent these areas. We want you to not just know the good guys, but we also want you to know the people who are causing problems. And we want you to make sure that you keep on top of them by keeping regular contacts on them and, when appropriate, making arrests. So enforcement was very, very much part of what they tried to do. This project was overseen by a deputy superintendent, and then they put a monthly CompStat-like process in place to make sure that people were actually implementing the program and they were generating the desired effects. Uh, so this is where, in my employment with the PD in terms of them having 50% of my time, this is getting on circa 2008. And the uh, city of Boston, like most cities in, in, in the country, were reeling from severe budget cuts. And that's when police departments were laying off folks. Fortunately, in the city of Boston, they never laid off any police officers, but they were laying off civilian staff. And there was no way that the commissioner could keep you know, paying for uh, my work as his chief policy advisor. So thankfully, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, through their Smart Policing Initiative, they had a solicitation where they were encouraging these types of research uh, practitioner partnerships to understand crime problems, develop solutions to those crime problems, and then measure the effects. 
So thankfully, uh, with some BJA support, I was able to continue my work in pretty much the same role, much more focusing in on, on this uh, safe, safe street team. And we did a process evaluation. Uh, the police department wanted to better understand uh, process evaluation and impact evaluation, whether the officers were implementing the program as uh, they had intended. So as part of it, they were supposed to be documenting problems, uh, the characteristics of the problems, the strategies they were using to implement them, we reviewed all the paperwork that the sergeants in charge with each hotspot was submitting to the deputy superintendent. I interviewed each sergeant rolling out a big map of their actual hotspot, and I had them identify, you know, this is a vacant house that we shut down, this was, a, this was a, a, a building where we had to do an enforcement action with the drug control unit because someone was selling drugs out of that, this is a bar that we had to crack down with city ordinances, you know, this is a, this is a community-based groups uh, community center that we were working with in order to stimulate more citizen involvement in the strategy that we're doing. And also, as I said at the beginning, I did regular ride-alongs with these officers. Well, there were more walk-alongs and uh, bike-alongs. Uh, so, but to get out there and just not only you know, review the paperwork and interview them, but see the work that they were doing as well. Uh, so over the course of 2007 and 2009, we figured out that they had implemented 396 different problem-solving interventions uh, across these 13 places. That's r roughly 15 situational responses. And these are things such as uh, you know, fixing broken fences, securing abandoned buildings, improving lighting, those types of situational problems. It's roughly about six enforcement responses per place. These are things such as uh, collaborating with a drug control unit. Uh, some of them did do Operation Ceasefire, focus deterrence stuff to deal with gangs in those areas. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a later, as well as nine community social service types of actions in each of the places as well. Then we did an impact evaluation. Uh, what was nice was because Ed Davis rooted the decision making on what hots and the identification of the hotspots and made such an upfront investment in analyzing the spatial nature of violence in the city, uh, we were very well positioned to do a rigorous quasi-experimental design. Now those 13 teams did not cover all of the violent areas in the city. Uh, it just was simply not possible, given the resources of the Boston Police Department, to cover more than 13 teams. So this actually you know, lend itself to a good quasi-experimental evaluation. So what we did was we looked at and we did statistical matching propensity scores. We matched street segments and intersections that had, that were in the safe street team areas to street segments and, seat and uh, intersections that had similar levels of violent crime that were nested in similar neighborhoods that had similar uh, proximity to other hot street units. Uh, as well as disadvantaged levels in the neighborhoods within, within which these hotspots uh, ar arose. We also, we then looked at growth curve regression. We use growth curve regression models to do uh, an analysis of the changes in these places and the treatment group relative to the comparison group over time. And we tried to figure out whether they were simply just displacing crime by, we use this to limit the selection of, of places uh, of, of comparison groups, but by looking at two block buffer zones around the treatment areas relative to the comparison areas. And this just gives you a sense for how it ended up treating out. Uh, the blue, these are the places, the, the segments and intersections within the, the hotspot treatment areas that uh, got matched to these comparison areas. So as you can see, we definitely did not cover every single hot segment uh, and intersection in the city. But when you looked at the trajectory of crime over time, you, know, you can see the blue is actually the treatment and the red is the comparison areas. After the program was implemented, you have in the comparison areas a slow downward trend. And in the blue areas, in the treatment areas, a much more radical decrease. Run the statistical analysis and what you have is a 17% reduction overall in violent crimes in those places those intersections and street segments that had a safe street team relative to the same types of or matched areas that did not have a safe street team. And that was driven by a 19% reduction in robberies, 
and a 15% reduction in aggravated assaults. There was no evidence of any spatial dis displacement. In fact, the areas showed or sur immediately surrounding the targeted locations found some evidence of a diffusion of benefits, meaning the crime decreased a little bit. Not so large that we could say it wouldn't have happened by chance alone, but certainly it was going in a positive direction rather than the expectations that by pressing down on crime here, it was just going to move around the corner. Um, there's anecdotal, a lot of anecdotal evidence that uh, police relationships with the communities in those areas improved as well. I did some interviewing with community-based groups there. There was a lot of popular uh, press coverage as well. We did try to do a, a bigger survey. The city of Boston did every single year a survey of city residents that had questions on the police services that they were receiving, but because of the, the budget cuts in 2008, they didn't do it in 2009, 2010, so we didn't have a post-test. Um, but clearly, uh, a significant impact in violent crime. Now, the risky people strategy, the real question that was facing the city of Boston then was, should we go back to implementing Operation Ceasefire, this pulling levers, focus deterrence strategy that the city was so well known for doing during the 1990s? Uh, it had stopped in 2000, and there were questions at the time when Ed Davis took over whether it was still an appropriate intervention to be doing uh, in 2007. Some people said, oh, well, gangs have changed. You know, the nature of violence out there is, is very different. So one of the things I did for the Boston police was to do the basic problem analysis. I just replicated a lot of the basic things that we did in the 1990s to, to diagnose this. And you know, pretty much the same neighborhoods were hot. We reviewed uh, homicides. And you can see most of the resurgence in violence. The top line, sorry, is are total homicides. The second line is the share of those homicides or the number of gang-related homicides. So you can see this steady increase over the 2000s uh, up until 2007 in the number of gang homicides that were occurring. When you looked at the gang relationships, this was a is a uh, sociogram or social network analysis looking at each of these nodes represents a particular gang. You found very much the same thing that you did during the 1990s. Roughly 1% of the city youth were participating in gangs. These gang feuds were generating at least 50% of the total homicides and gang members were involved in two thirds of all of the uh, non-fatal shootings. Uh, most of these uh, gang-involved offenders were incredibly well-known to the criminal justice system, and most of them were under some form, or not most of them, but a large share of them were on probation, parole, or juvenile correction supervision. So there was a lot of, uh, of, of possibilities for re-implementing a, 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 a focused deterrence pulling levers strategy, which they did. So when we're doing our analysis of all of our all of our shootings, and it's worth saying how the, that, that was done. So every single year, going back to 1994, I debrief homicide detectives on their cases from the previous year. And I'm only asking them questions on circumstances. Okay, homicide of Anthony Braga, who was he? Uh, if you didn't make an arrest, you know, tell me your best guess at what happened in, his, in this homicide. If it was a gang-related homicide, I'd ask questions about the groups involved, whether it was part of a cycle of retaliation, et cetera. Uh, under Ed Davis, we expanded this to include non-fatal shootings as well. So I would still interview the homicide detectives, but working with their uh, intelligence and analysis center, we would quarterly call in the, uh, the for each of the high-risk districts that were experiencing shootings, uh, the officers who were assigned in the hotspot areas, gang unit officers assigned, drug control unit officers, and we would ask the same sets of questions for uh, these, these different shootings. So we're able to get a lot of information on the gangs involved in the shootings, and we're able to produce charts like this. In 2006, the most violent gang in the city of Boston was the Lucerne Street Dogs. Uh, they were, they generated 30 shootings, they were the victim of seven shootings. Early in Ed Davis's uh, tenure in 2007, 
they were on a torrid pace to even exceed the previous year's total. And this is roughly, the gang is, was roughly about 55 individuals, seven individuals who are doing most of the shootings, but these seven individuals in that year accounted for 10% of all the city's shootings, incredibly concentrated. So they selected this, this group in early 2006 during the spring for a ceasefire intervention. They implemented it in May of 2004, and as you can see, the next several years, very, very low rates of, of shootings committed by and against this group. Uh, it really had a large impact on, on the, uh, the violent behavior. Excellent. And I did a similar evaluation of the ceasefire intervention. Red lines are groups that received this intervention. Blue are groups that did not, uh, gangs in the city that did not. And what I found was that when the Boston Police Department and its partners did a focused deterrence strategy to these groups, you had a 31% change in the trajectory of, of shootings for those groups that experienced a ceasefire intervention relative to groups that did not. And what was really nice is that this whole way of monitoring the riskiest groups has, within the police department, taken on a life of its own. And I think that's one of the important things. You know that you've produced something of value to a police department if, when you're done doing your little project with it, that they actually keep doing it. So what they do, they keep every quarter reviewing the, the shootings, and they develop you know, this ongoing way or this dashboard of the riskiest groups in the city. So what this slide shows that in the top gangs in 2010, where they were at in 2011. So in 2010, Mozart was the number one group with 16 shootings. In 2011, they only generated three shootings. So clearly, whatever they did, a ceasefire intervention with this group seemed to be having its desired effects. Cameron Street seems to be persisting. Mission actually is getting worse, as is Franklin Field. Got to go back and assess what you're doing with them, see, see if you have to do something different. So they use this gang scorecard on an ongoing basis to assess their effectiveness. <coughs> so the benefits for an academic in terms of being an, an embedded criminologist, one, access to unique data. I mean, the data that I'm able to get out of the Boston Police Department in terms of the richness, the level of detail, the ability to, to really understand the nature of, of violent crime problems uh, is, is incredibly impressive. Access to officers, uh, being able to get out there, work with police officers, get their insights on what's going wrong, get their insights on if they could do something different, what they would do is incredibly valuable information. And it's also rewarding to feel like you're actually making a difference, that you're working you know, with public safety agencies to make a city safer. It's, it's, it's a much better feeling than you know, the third article that I got in a year accepted at a good, good quality journal. I mean, it's, it, it's very rewarding stuff. And I think it's really improved my ability to be an academic. <laughs> you know, I have a much better understanding of the complexity of crime problems as they play out in neighborhoods. I understand in a way, unless you're there in organizations, how internal and external uh, politics influence the capacity of an organization to respond, you know, different uh, ideas about organizational behavior, and the reality that police departments face that they're always dealing with limited resources. For police, you know, they get important insights on the nature of violent crime problems. And this isn't, I mean, a lot of the insights you know, officers have, but it's, you know, it's an exercise in getting all the facts straight and putting the facts on the table in a way that can lead to interventions. So for, ex for a quick example, um, the mayor's office was looking for information on where the guns were coming from. So instead of consulting, a, doing, doing analysis, they connected him to the special investigations unit that just wrapped up a gun trafficking case that most of the guns in this one particular case was coming from New Hampshire. So this officer said, oh, well, the guns are all coming from New Hampshire. The mayor said, oh, okay, well, you know, I'm gonna start using my bully pulpit, and the mayor's against illegal guns, and, and all the influence I have to, to denounce the guns that are coming from our northern neighbor. If they had done the full analysis, they would have shown that only 10% of the guns that they recovered were actually coming from New Hampshire. I mean, clearly there's a pipeline of guns coming from New Hampshire, 
But the bigger problems are guns coming up from I-95 states, as well as guns coming from within, within the, uh, the state of Massachusetts itself, roughly about 30%. So you know, having a partner that's embedded in the organization to take a broader look at all the p potential sources uh, that contribute to a problem is, is really, really important, I think. You know, determining what works, an objective voice of strategy meetings, as well as uh, credibility with the media. Uh, I got called upon many times to explain the strategies, you know, why they were doing particular types of actions, showing the data that supports and justifies what they were doing, and also showing that it seemed to be having an effect. So when the police department was saying, hey, we reduced crime by, violent crime by 30% over the last five years, you actually had someone to say, yeah, there's this pretty good evidence that they own a large piece of that because violence uh, in these hot spots have gone down and also uh, shootings have gone down pretty dramatically. So one of the things that I always struggle with is the funding challenges because you know, I still wear the academic hat. I mean, my main job is as a professor uh, and as a, as a researcher in academic institutions. Uh, the way funding is generally set up funds projects. Now, if you are embedded in a particular institution, what makes you effective are relationships. And it's difficult to fund a relationship over time, particularly given police department budgets that are incredibly strained. So it was impressive that for a two and a half year period, Ed Davis was willing to take the money for as long as he could from his own operating budget, you know, but a, a time came where he couldn't. And thankfully, BJA, Smart Policing, was able to pick up the slack there. Um, but I think there's a lot of value to this work and we just gotta figure out better uh, funding challenges. Political changes, uh, Ed Davis, at the beginning of November, stepped down as the commissioner of the Boston Police Department. There is an interim commissioner who's running the police department now. He happens to be the head of patrol that I worked with to design the hotspots policing program. So as long as he's there, he told me I'm not changing a thing, but it's unclear whether he's gonna be the next commissioner. The next commissioner who comes in might just say, you know, maybe it's somebody that I pissed off when I was there for the last five years because I did make some enemies. Um, uh, so you don't know which way the wind's gonna blow uh, and you could, be, you could be out, and that's, that's, that's something to think about. Organizational placement, it was an incredibly important moment when Ed Davis made that announcement that I was his chief policy advisor. He gave me a desk in his, in his suite and he explained to everybody exactly what I was doing. That, that just removed a lot of the tension because people said, oh, okay, well, he's not trying to be a deputy commissioner. This is what his job is. His job is to help. He's gonna be engaging us in doing things that hopefully you know, will get us a, a better handle on, on dealing with the violent crime problem. Uh, trust is obviously essential. Always, always, always report your findings to the police department first. You know, just run ahead of them. Uh, I always update them on my findings as they, uh, as they become available before I've even written them out. I'll, you know, grab different people who it will, influ uh, who it will affect and I'll pull them aside and I'll say, hey, look, this is what it seems to be showing. I want you to know that. Uh, and then just being there, being around, being a regular presence in the police department. So, you know, you have coffee with people, you go out to lunch with people, people see you at meetings. You know, they, they, you know that goes a long way in, in their willingness to, to deal, with, deal with you. And also, you know, as I said, routine conversations with line level people, important stuff. And then, you know, the other thing is you, you still have to re remember that you're an academic. And academics play by rules. You, know, you always have to be you know, transparent in what you're doing. You, know, you have to be able to break the bad news when something does not work as well. So it's what I call disciplined passion because there have been people who said, hey Anthony, you know, you're getting really close to the Boston Police Department. Are you going native? Are you uh, losing your objectivity? And I said, no, I mean, I follow very you know, specific rules on how the scientific method is implemented. Here's the data. I often involve other academics in my evaluations of programs that I've been involved with. 
If any of you have seen any of my publications, you probably notice it has a whole bunch of people going out the tail end. And that's because I want people to look at it and say, look, this is what I found. You tell me if you find the same. So I will work with other academics to make sure that I'm not missing something or seeing something that I want to see in the work that I'm doing. And also, you know, I often make my data available. Uh, I say, look, this is what I found. If you want to take a look at it and find something else, go right ahead. Um, but being transparent in that way, I think when you have these close relationships is even more important. And that's all. Thank you.